Well, good morning, everybody. I wanted to do a quick analysis of the last 30 days so we can look at some new NDVI imagery that came out from NASA. So our first map here looks at the last 30 days in terms of percent of normal precipitation. A lot of the story we've been carrying uh, is still here. So extremely dry along the Pacific Northwest. We've been extremely wet from Montana all the way down here through the you know Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, New Mexico, Western Kansas, and then into Oklahoma. And then this quarter and through here just lately had just a tremendous amount of rainfall. But you know that this region and through here, which has kind of lacked good strong upper level flow, has just missed out on a lot of precipitation. It's been wetter the farther west you go. And we did have a big system last weekend that came through and tried to relieve some of the drought that was in uh, parts of the uh, northeast. We know there is a system that's curling up here over the southeast that's going to help to bring back these areas to normal in terms of precipitation. But just looking at the, the change from the, the Corn Belt to the Plains in terms of precipitation, I wanted to kind of just look at it two other ways and then go right on into this new NDVI data. So the next way is in terms of temperatures. I think about the only thing that has saved this from being an absolute disaster in certain parts of the Corn Belt is that the heat has primarily been in the northern Corn Belt when you compare it to normal. So this is a 30-day map of temperature anomalies. So remember, this is relative to the location. So compared to normal, most of the heat has been throughout this part of Canada. All right. We've been quite cold. We've looked at this in terms of the uh, GDD anomalies for several times over the last uh, 10 or so videos. But it's been important to note that there's been an area through here that's been very dry, but has not yet seen long duration extreme heat. Now we got some 90s coming into this area, but it's just important to see you know, the differences. We are way behind on GDDs in the southeast. We're making up with the heat that's coming into Texas now, and we're way off in California into the Four Corner states. The third map, just to get us set up for this uh, this G, uh, NDVI analysis, looks like this. This is the cumulative downward solar flux anomaly map. So this one shows us where we've had um, excess sunshine compared to average, or the cloud cover has been more than normal, where you see the blue. So. And through these areas, a lot of sunshine coming into this region. That's what we've got here. We've had more cloudy days, right where you expect. It's where all the heaviest rains have been. And the marine strata cumulus layer has been truly impressive uh, in this area in terms of just blocking the sun from getting down to the surface. Okay, those three maps get us set up to see this. Now, I'd love to spend a lot of time on this. It's a great resource. I'll link it in the notes below so you have access to it again. But if we just do something real quick, let's go to the West Coast. I'm going to pick up Washington, Oregon, and California. And when you look at these three states, and we are right now near the top end of the distribution through the middle part of June uh, with respect to NDVI, so above the average, way above last year. Most of this is because of California being at its lowest point last year. From there, we're going to just skip over most of the desert and then come right down to these states. Let's just pick up, we'll pick up Oklahoma as well. Now, when you look right into this quarter where there's been a tremendous amount of thunderstorm activity, it is the highest in DVI in the last 20 years and way above where we were a year ago. Of course, this area was in drought. If I lop off Texas and Colorado and Wyoming and Montana, but now just pick up Kansas and Nebraska, again, it is still quite high despite some regional drought problems still in Kansas, Nebraska, and pockets of Oklahoma. All right. From here, I'm just going to take you quickly to the Northern Plains. So let's go pick up, uh, let's go to Northern Plains and the upper Midwest. We're also gonna pick up parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Now, if you look, we're right on average, but a year ago, the NDVI, that's what's shown in this line right here, did dip below average for quite some time. We have a lot of rain coming into this area here in the next 10 days. So I do expect the NDVI to respond in a positive way to the rains that are coming into this region. From there, let's now go right into the primary corn and soybean belt. I'm going to leave Minnesota out of this. We're going to pick up um, you know, these states. In fact, let's not call this the primary corn and soybean belt. Let's call this Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, and, and Missouri because that excludes some very important corn growing areas. Now, the NDVI right now is right on average, but this is not yet capturing the stress to the crop. I can go out here and drive through fields in Illinois and tell you that they're green, but uh, you know the, the crop is clearly stressed by what's going on here. Let's take these off. Let's quickly just grab some of the eastern Corn Belt states. So I'm just going to grab Ohio. We'll go to Pennsylvania. We'll also grab uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and I'll put Indiana back in the mix again. And this was an area that dropped off considerably. In fact, we we're at the lowest end of the distribution until the rains that just came through here last weekend. And let's finally, <clears throat> excuse me, let's click off these. Sorry, this takes me a moment. And let's go down here <clears throat> to the southeast. 
And if you notice right now, and this is largely driven by Georgia, to be honest with you, we are well above average on the GDDs in, in the southeast. And the last drought area I think we should just hit real quick, and I apologize if I didn't click explicitly on your state, but if we go here into parts of the interior of New England, drought stressed very early this season, heavy rains last week, but still at the bottom of the distribution. But notice how it usually just flatlines in the Northeast for several months here. Just important to see those differences. Okay, I just wanted to show you that. And again, I'm gonna put the link down in the description below. Go, go play with this website. Uh, again, how I got there, let me just reload this page so you know how I got to the one where you see the states. So when you arrive on it, it gives you countries and you can go all over the world to see different places. <clears throat> Excuse me, the data here are from MODIS. Uh, that was actually a satellite uh, platform that I got to work on when I was in graduate school. But anyways, you come down here and click on admin level one right there. That's the one you want to click on. Now you can see the individual provinces and states and whatnot. From here, though, I want to show you some data, so the uh, some satellite data, excuse me. So the sun was rising a little bit late this morning. I apologize for that. So the sun has already made it here. Uh, tomorrow's the solstice, so this will be the greatest angle you'll see on the day-night line where we switch from visible to infrared. Here's the upper level low that's going to spin its way over into the southeast, but take a look at last night. So we still have quite a bit of smoke in the atmosphere. These are from fires that have since been mostly put out in parts of Canada. And uh, there was a couple of storms in through here that really caught my attention. Of course, what's orbiting around here going into North Carolina, Virginia, some severe weather. But this storm at the tail end down here in southern Mississippi, it just continued to build back on the boundary right in through here, delivering some incredibly heavy rain into the overnight hours, barely moved, causing flooding. We also had a very large complex of storms in, in Texas. And then this is the deep trough that's in the west and the flow just screaming, producing these big storms here in parts of Montana as well. So we look back over the last 24 hours. Let's get, we should have a 7 a, uh, 6 a.m. update here. We can see that uh, just this whole region, heavy, heavy rainfall once again, and then around that upper level low and right in through there, that is where that storm stalled out producing some places up to six to 10 inches of rainfall causing flooding down here in southern Mississippi and Alabama. And there's some very important acres down here right along the Gulf Coast. So from here, I wanna show you the newest storm report data so we can kind of see where those severe th thunderstorm events were. But I wanna quickly flip this over to the new convective outlook map because we know we're watching right now for the evolution of a pattern that could possibly be pushing in more storms to maybe cascade into the northern plains and the Pacific Northwest and giving some relief to this corridor, which has seen them almost nonstop now for, uh, for quite some time. So this is today's uh, day one convective outlook. Let's flip it over to uh, day two. So again, we're gonna watch for storms here, but also blowing up here in the high plains, but notice some relief down here in the Southeast, not the constant risk of a uh, higher threat of severe weather. Day three, keeping again a close look on the high plains. But some of the new day four stuff and five stuff is interesting. So let's just hover over these. Day four, to see the SPC put out a day four outlook is important. That means they're honing in on ingredients that will likely result in strong storms right in through this part of Nebraska. And then they have day five, that moving over here into parts of the central and western Corn Belt. And remember, we are watching at the end of this week and this weekend for a shortwave trough to show up right here, increasing the threat of storms to cascade through some of the driest parts of the country when you compare it to average. Now, the high-res NAM won't gather that. It's, it's, it's too short of a model. But I just want to show you what it's got here through the day on Tuesday. Look at all the storms orbiting this upper level low. Look at the storms tonight blowing up here in parts of Nebraska and the Dakotas and coming out of Montana. The deeper upper level low producing scattered showers and storms tonight over parts of the Pacific Northwest. So then we play this into the overnight hours and bring it out into tomorrow morning through tomorrow midday. And again, more storms right along this corridor Look at this. And then here over the southeast. This rain is desperately needed in this area, although we need it to kind of slow down a bit because as the slow continues to stack up and stay put, more rain runs up against the Appalachian Mountains, delivering a lot of, of, of very heavy rain. I'll show you the totals in a second. But again, this corridor in through here is the beginning of what we hope will be storms that kind of can roll through this area. I've been quite skeptical on that. I'll show you again why I am skeptical on it, but that's what I see. Now the next seven days, this is the newest from the WPC. So they've got, remember my contour lines, the first one right in through here, that black contour is a half inch. The second one is an inch and a half. So the WPC coming out of Montana, throughout the Dakotas, Western Nebraska, 
all the way over to the Red River Valley of the north, and even into northern Wisconsin, has got heavy rains coming into this area. We can then see where that upper level low is going to sit and spin. The flow is going to come around out of the east and really add up the rainfall right here in the Carolinas. Again, we're looking at five, six inches possible in this particular area. The setup is still quite the same. And there's that large ridge that was over Texas we're watching. Here's the deep uh, excuse me, deep trough prompting the frost and freeze issues in parts of the desert here in the west. We have our saddle point. That has not changed. That's where the ridge is extending up toward the Hudson Bay. And here's the low. Now the biggest problem I have with storms that are going to fire up here making their way into the Midwest is the fact that right now and for the rest of this week there's a low here. So if you have a low over the southeast, the flow is in the wrong direction to return moisture ahead of this event. That's all that narrative about the missing subtropical high, the Bermuda high. So this is it. This is what's ruining or robbing this region of, of moisture. So here's the wave, ready? As we just play through the deep trough in the west, the big ridge that extends from Texas all the way up to eastern Canada, that's that saddle point I talked about. But this is still that kind of omega look in the pattern. Now, you know, I haven't been calling it Omega because of its duration. It's got to be there 10 days, and it breaks down. It breaks down after five days. And so we get this extension of the jet. I like it. We then have a shortwave that's going to come over the top of it right here. But the setup man, this guy right here, is ruining everything for returning moisture into this area because the flow around these lows is like this. Now, it is helping to break drought in this area. It's helping to deliver a lot of rain. But as this trough shows up, normally we would look at this trough and be talking about a major outbreak of strong to severe storms in this area. Instead, we're watching to the south of it and to the north of it where those storms are going to go through. So this is on Sunday, getting into Monday and Tuesday when some colder air starts to come in to the east. And we're right back to where we've been talking about in the pattern. Flow continuing to do something like this. All right. So let's go ahead and look at the models real quick. This is the newest ECMWF run. Now, if you remember last night, if you watched my in-depth, we were watching for this weekend for this area to fill in. So all of this has been discussed already. We then expected those storms to come cascading into Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, southeast Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana. And those are states that love to hear me say their names with rain in the forecast. But when you look at this, I'll let you know that the latest model trend in that area was drier compared to the previous run. It's also important to note how much drier the next this current model run was than the one I showed you last night in parts of North Carolina, Virginia. Now, this is not to say it's not going to rain. It's just no longer showing 10 inches of rain in this area, so it backed off a bit on that. You can also see that it went drier in this area as well. But there are still storms cascading through this region, and that's what you can see. So a little bit of a pullback north, a pullback on the incredibly heavy rain here, and a pullback on what's going through this area. Now, you know the operational runs, that's all they are. They're just a single run. They, they change dramatically run to run to run. That's why we look at the ensemble so closely. But I need to show you the other operational run we look at, and this is the GFS. So the GFS has something similar, but it's trying to split the storms more north and then cascading down here to the south in Missouri. So this is the next seven days from the European model. Now you'll notice that the GFS also gets pretty happy at the end of its run, bringing something out of the tropics down here. Look down here. It's trying to once again develop some sort of a tropical system into the Gulf of Mexico. That is another phantom storm in the GFS. There's no ensemble support for it. And the National Hurricane Center is not looking at it either. But they are watching a wave on the backside here with given a 70% chance of development. And the lead wave called Tropical Storm Brett, we still expect this one to be moving toward the Lesser Antilles by Friday. And then once it gets into the Caribbean, it will likely lose a lot of its punch because of the strong winds that are in the Caribbean disrupting the flow of that storm. But that's our, uh, you know, our second name system of the year, Brett. It is a tropical storm as of the 5 a.m. update this morning, and it's got sustained winds at 40 miles an hour. But the ensemble support for what Brett might be up to, so it's right here. Okay, Notice we're not seeing this make the turn. And we see the second system here turning out to open ocean, giving us an indication on where that Bermuda high is currently sitting. Okay, ensembles. This is the newest 10 day forecast looking at the probability of getting an inch. So we're just trying to hone in again on where the ensemble package is giving the best probabilities. And this is what we use when we look out this far. 
Let's step this up first. So this is the chances of getting two inches of rain out of this. There's a lot of people in this area that desperately need this rain. There's a whole lot more, I think, in this area that need this rain as well. But look how wet it's going to be down here in the Carolinas to Georgia and into Florida. Probability of four inches, we continue to hone in on that area right in through there as being the wettest region. On the flip side, our drier locations, this is the probability of getting less than a half inch. What's important is those probabilities have been dropping in this area. It's not a cure. We still have to get rid of that southeastern trough to get the storms to cascade in here. But it is now looking better in the ensembles of getting a half inch out of some of these storms into this area. The week two forecast looks something like this. So we continue to see the CPC and the GFS in agreement, except over the south, which is where we know the GFS has a bias, okay? But this area that's drier in through here just continues to kind of shift its position around in the European model. And that's where they've got in the uh, CPC equal chances overall. So wet northwest, wet northeast, storms running over the top, dry where the ridge is. That's the pattern we're going to be seeing here going forward. Now in this morning's all hazards weather map, we have a lot of air quality issues. We have the flood watches out. The uh, excessive heat warnings have expanded to the Red River Valley. And then you notice a lot of acres here in the desert, of course, that have got uh, freeze warnings and, and frost advisories out. So let's look at those temperatures this morning at 620 when I was recording this. Quite cold in a few of these pockets this morning while the heat's really still on here. We didn't get these overnight lows out of the 70s last night and through this area. There is some bad data here in Mississippi. We'll have to figure out why that is, but I just want to let you know that's what's going on here. There's not like a nuclear furnace burning in somewhere in Mississippi. So from there, the frost map, again, we're going to see a lot of this interior desert area hitting uh, a, free, a frost um, uh, this morning. And if we look at what the high temperatures are going to do, here's today's high temperatures, a lot of 90s throughout the Corn Belt, maybe cracking 100 up here in this part of uh, you know the northern plains before the storms, and then quite hot down in Texas. But look at the cold in the west. There's Wednesday's highs, Thursday's. The southeast does not break over warm at all in the next six to seven days. There's thir uh, Friday, excuse me, getting into Saturday and Sunday. And remember, next Sunday into Monday is when that trough is expected to slide through this area. And that's going to be the critical time period to see if we can tap into some moisture here. Looking overall at the 15-day outlook for temperatures, this is that five-day sliding window I like to show you. And here we are out there, day five through 10. So cooler from California through the northern tier of the U.S. and down into the southeast. But again, the heat is on in this area. And as we play this out farther, because of the pattern really kind of hanging on to more troughs in this area, we just don't break away. This just continues to stay cool the farther out we look. So this is an area that has not yet actually seen what I would consider heat yet this year. Finally, I want to show you um, two things in case you missed it. Last night, this was the newest update from the ECMWF looking at the month of July. We talked about the CPC data, but they'll update their stuff on, um, on Friday. We'll even get a new update of this before that on Thursday night. And then I want to finally show you the latest global precipitation map from the European model. I want to know how stormy it is in parts of Europe right now. I also want you to see Southeast Asia incredibly wet. Same thing with India, very wet. But a lot of the Manchurian Plain and North China Plain continue to struggle with some drought. Extremely heavy rain coming into parts of Australia, not well forecast a week ago. But those rains coming in there, most of this is going to be in the outback, not hitting major Per, uh, crop area in through here, but we need to see how this moves in to the rest of Australia because most of Australia was expecting significant drought uh, right now uh, because of the um, because of the ongoing development of El Nino, and uh, so just wanted to point that out to you. We are drier in Brazil while they harvest and the temperatures are coming up here, so this is going to be like some fall warmth, quicker dry down. They're going to get a lot of harvest progress done as we work our way to the end of June. All right, that's all I got for you. I will talk to you again tomorrow morning. Until then, have a good one. Thanks.